Hi, my name is Eric, and in this series I'm challenging myself to create an original sci-fi world, rich with history, lore, and plenty of robots, all based on these models I build from scratch. Today we'll be traveling to the island of Korat, part of an archipelago in the eastern sea known as the Deadlands. And, as nearly all of you asked for in a recent poll, the narration for this entire build will be in the form of a short story. This is Gamey Builds, and welcome to Beyond the Blight. Before we dive into the short story, I wanted to mention that this build was made possible by Wayne Losey, a toy designer who was kind enough to supply me with several Modabots, these highly customizable, posable plastic figures that are absolutely perfect for what I do. If you would like to try your hand at building a similar droid, go check out the Modabot website at the link below. Thanks also to the lovely patrons who help make these videos possible. If you too want to support this channel, consider pledging on Patreon, where you'll have early access to videos like this one and extra content like behind the scenes photos and bonus video shorts. And now, onto the story. It's your standard slasher model, said the salesman, shrugging. The violet flickering of his barely functioning neon signs splayed fingers of light across the dusty warehouse floor, illuminating what looked like well-fed rodents scampering from shadow to shadow. What's the date of manufacture? Len asked, ignoring the impatient air the salesman gave off. The slasher was the fifth model she'd been shown that afternoon, and she suspected the man was growing weary of playing tour guide. Who knows? Serial numbers all been filed off and the drives were scrubbed clean when I got it. Chippers did a fresh install of one of their dark systems. It isn't traceable. It looks pre-blight. Look, miss, I'm not in the business of speculation. I'm here to move units, and if you're simply window shopping... I'll take it, the girl interrupted. Pardon? This. This is the one I want. What are you asking for it? Well... I... it's in good condition. Comms work well if you wanted it for remote services. I'll give you 500 ings, the girl said, already twisting the cuff of her bracelet to activate the pay stripe. 500? That's a little low. Well, you're clearly short on details for this model, and frankly, it's a lot worse for wear than the ones out front. Besides, demand for older models isn't high, especially out here near the coast. You think I'm running a charity here? The man scoffed, although Len could sense his resolve wavering. Don't worry, I'd never peg you as the charitable type. Five hundred ings, and I take this crust bucket off your hands. Six hundred. The two said nothing for a moment as the silence of the damp warehouse seeped in around them. The girl shook her head, adamant. Five hundred. It's keyed in and ready to transfer, she said holding up her wrist to show the man the figure flickering on the liquid display. The man finally threw his hands up. Fine, take it, but no delivery. Getting it out of here is your problem. Len allowed herself a measured smile, careful not to seem smug. The salesman wristlet clinked and chimed as the funds found their destination. Enjoy your slasher, he said coolly before turning and retreating off into the shadows to join the cobwebs and rodents. Back in her workshop, the girl's data recovery module revealed the manufacturer's date, proving it to be pre-blight after all, if only by a few years. Judging from the unusually horizontal wear on the shoulder joints, she suspected it had once been a harvester, a farm bot, a true workhorse. This was good. As unhelpful as the salesman had been, he'd been honest about the comms, and in spite of the droid's age, its signal receivers worked without issue. It only took an afternoon of minor code updates to connect it to her home console. She didn't love the fact that it ran on a dark chipper system, Unauthorized software architecture was frowned on by the cleaning administration, but she hoped they'd make an exception. She needed the money, and they needed the remote services. Len strapped into the console, pressed the pedals, and eased her palms against the controls. 
A delicate touch was the difference between an experienced pilot and a 10-in slasher. She gently increased her pressure, alert to any feedback. Even the flimsier looking pre-blight models were known to be swift and strong, their sensitivity levels unknowable prior to a test drive. Among the service teams, there was no shortage of stories of droid pilots punching holes through walls, or the pilots themselves, after booting up second-hand remotes. And Len didn't have funds for repairs or medical bills. The old droid finally grown to life, servos whirring, rotors grinding in puffs of rusty dust. Still, everything worked, and now it stood before her, comms blinking with readiness, receivers chirping, its head lens dilating and constricting as it auto-focused on the face of its new owner. Len spent the rest of the day testing the balance systems, which would be crucial for the job at hand. In addition to fast response times, the droid's gyros had to function impeccably. There was a reason they didn't send humans into the Deadlands. Next came the customizations. Armor plating fastened by bolts to each of the appendages, in case the slasher chanced upon a nest of spike slethas. A back-mounted pack containing additional battery units and a comm booster ensured that the droid would never be out of range and that it could operate beyond the three-day contract, which Len expected was a gross underestimate and probably intentional. The company behind this particular job, ECRA Consulting, was infamous for charging steep recovery fees for retrieving lost or damaged droids. If she wasn't careful, she could end up spending more than she earned. The pack meant extra weight and a total gyro recalibration, but it was worth it. The cloaked hood was the one decorative accoutrement Len allowed herself. It was crafted from an old shawl she'd worn herself. If asked about its purpose, Len would state that it humanized the droid resulting in a sort of bond between pilot and machine, but in reality, she simply liked the way it looked. You are watching Katie Builds. Thank you, and enjoy the bite. ECRA Consulting's recruitment center was like no other Len had ever seen. It was a far cry from the drab, soulless, pockmarked concrete structures that typically served such purposes. Here, Towering glass windows with embossed bronze trim shimmered in the late afternoon sun. Intricate glass mosaics decorated the lobby walls, backlit by light diodes so that the images pulsed with a life of their own. And even through the soles of her boots, Len could feel the richness of the woven rug beneath her. Every detail was redolent of decadence. For her, it was the stench of wealth unattainable. Pilotier. Your recruiter will see you now, spoke a chrome-plated drone, emerging from the hexagonal hole in the ceiling and turning to lead the girl down a hallway. Len sat moments later across from a gaunt-faced woman in a burgundy corporal's uniform, sapphire chevrons pinned to her collar. A giant marble desk formed a barrier between the two. Len kept quiet as the woman flitted through images on her desk console. It is a privilege to be called on by ECRA Consulting. I hope you appreciate that, said the corporal without looking up at the girl. Less than 3% of applicants ever receive a summons. Thank you, Len said, her tone apparently too casual as the decorated woman shot her a caviling look. You come to us with a recommendation from your previous employer, Danik Enterprises. Typically, we do not work with smaller companies outside the administration circle. But these are atypical times, Len thought. You are familiar with the island of Korat? I've done my research, watched all the reels, but I've never been there. It's well beyond my rank. But still, you applied. After my last mission, and then your job posting, I thought I'd give it a shot, yes. Then you already know the local tribes have been all but completely exterminated. For whatever reason, the mutations on the archipelago are especially aggressive toward the human population. Most of the remaining villagers are being ferried off the islands and relocated. Only the most stubborn remain, said the corporal. Len nodded. All of this was well documented. These days, 
Missions to the archipelago were primarily for sport, a chance for pilots to prove their skills and thus gain entry to the elite guilds by way of highly publicized and broadcast events. It was no longer about ridding the land of the blight or the creatures it had spawned. The region was simply a hunting ground for droids and monsters alike. May I ask the details of the mission? After you sign the contract, yes, said the corporal. Len frowned. You're serious? The mission is a delicate one. Then surely I'm not the only assignee, Len said. She was a capable droid pilot, but realistic. Everything about this mission felt out of her league, and she sensed desperation on the other side of the desk. All assignees are subject to the same stipulations. If you choose not to sign, we will simply move to the next applicant. It did not take Len long to decide. This was a rare opportunity for a fresh start. She nodded as the marble surface before her illuminated to accept her fingerprints. First time to the Deadlands? The stranger asked over the thrumming repulsors of the dropship. His long face was gray and grooved with wrinkles, like a braided steel cable. First time, she said. You? Korat, yes, but I've been to the archipelago and hunted my share of big game. Even bagged some trophies, the man droned, the nails of his fingers tapping against the small bronze pins affixed to his jacket sleeves. Is it normal for them to bring pilots to a site like this? Len asked. I've always done remote services from my home console. The man waved her away with the sweep of a skeletal hand. That's Ekra for you. They always do things their way. They can afford to. You've been recruited by them before? Len inquired. Sure. Uh, Don't get me wrong, though. This is a peculiar job, said the man conspiratorially. All the secrecy. How much did they tell? Pilotier, Ekra Consultant reminds you of the discretion clause in your contractual agreement, barked a drone parking itself for a moment mid-air between the two pilots until the man acknowledged it with the roll of his eyes. Len sighed, leaning against the cold metal hull of the dropship. Up until the day before, she would have never believed the creature she'd been hired to exterminate even existed. It was like something out of a children's picture book, the kind of monster a frustrated parent would claim an unruly child might fall prey to unless it obeyed. Then again, The Blight had spawned every imaginable mutation, and many more unimaginable. From the creature's profile, she had already decided against a projectile weapon or firearm. She suspected the beast's tough, chitinous hide would deflect anything but a direct shot. A sword forged from Aegisian steel would be a handier option, allowing her to lop off its limbs one by one before dealing a death blow. By late afternoon, the dropship had arrived at Ekra Consulting's forward island base on the eastern tip of Korat. Len was surprised at the size of the complex and its infrastructure, and she and her droid were shortly shuttled to an underground comm center where the droid was paired with one of Ekra's state-of-the-art piloting consoles. Everything here was a black box. There would be no broadcasts, no spectators, No footage outside of what Ekra's equipment recorded. Ekra was the sole sponsor, and they were paying well. Len asked no questions as she strapped into the console and gripped the cold foreign controls. Len's remote droid emerged into the murky forest night atop a concrete pedestal that rose from an underground shaft. She used the droid's lens and sensors to quickly assess the surroundings. There seemed to be a delay in the video feed, perhaps it was difficult getting signals through the canopy, and she was thankful that she was on site after all. The forest was eerily still, save for a harmless cluster of cackling Aegisian chimps that scattered into the dark at the sight of the man-like machine. Len leaned into the controls and gently led her droid off the platform. A perimeter scan revealed no life forms larger than the fleeing primates, 
and so she pressed on, deeper into the thicket, beyond the reach of the moon and stars. Seventeen hours into the mission, Len finally reached the last known coordinates of the target. She was not the first pilot to discover this location, as evidenced by discarded battery packs and numerous remote footprints in the damp earth. The bottom half of a droid lay in a puddle of grease and microfluid, doubtless scavenged by other opportunistic pilots who needed the parts. Kale Sabat, the tree that eats. That was the creature that had brought her here. No one knew where it had come from, though the blight was a reasonable culprit. And it made sense, Len supposed, that if a creature like this should exist at all, it would be found in a place like this, teeming as it was with exotic life, throbbing fungal colonies, tiny phosphorescent reptiles perched on leaves, slithering beneath the detritus, watching her droid with wet, glowing eyes. That is when she heard the ping of her perimeter sensors, a large life form sulking just beyond the tree line, much too big for a primate. Could the creature smell droids, Len wondered. She clambered up an embankment and waited. But the beast that emerged gave her pause. It did not come charging through the underbrush in frenzied search of a meal, nor did it act with territorial aggression. It moved with thoughtful intent, its large, stump-like head pivoting back and forth as if searching for something. Odder still, the monster was emitting some sort of interference signal. It wasn't showing up on Ekra's console instruments, but the dark system installed by the chippers was sending anomalous feedback directly to the droid's comm relay, feedback that manifested as an undulating hiss in Len's headset, and it was growing louder. For a panicked moment, Len wondered if the beast might be more than the semi-sentient creature described in the dossier. What if it were communicating with others of its kind? What if she was the prey? Was this a new mutation, or perhaps an experiment gone wrong? A creature that Ekra and the rest of the administration could not afford to let escape from its island prison? Pilot here. Our observer drones indicate that you have made visual contact with the target. Explain your delay in attacking. I'm observing. There's a reason no one has been able to take this thing down and I hope to discover it. Acre Consulting reminds you of the no hesitation clause in your contract. Len switched off her radio comms. Why were they in such a rush? What were they hiding? Len crept her droid closer to the edge of the grassy embankment. The creature was now just below her, its head pointed at its forward-facing appendages. The limbs moved strangely, as if manipulating something invisible. The sputtering feedback in Len's ears grew to a crescendo, threatening to drive her mad. The console screens began to flicker and sway. Some other signal was struggling to take over. If she lost her visuals, her droid would be stranded, and as much as she wanted answers before attacking, she was running out of time. She pushed into the controls. Jumping to its feet, the droid charged toward the tip of the embankment, leg pistons pumping hydraulic fluid catapulting the machine high into the air, its sword poised above its head. The droid's lens focused on the beast below, the feedback hiss now a full deafening roar. The signal broke through, and Len's heart stopped. The Kale Sabat had disappeared, and in its place stood an old man in the tribal garb of the islanders, an interference box held in his arms. She could read his lips as she fell towards him. Please, stop. Thank you all so much for watching. And if you enjoyed the build and the story, let me know in the comments. A special thanks again to these patrons for helping make these projects possible. And until next time, this is Gamey Builds, over and out.